Good morning. Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Bo Becker. I'm a professor at the Swedish House of Finance at the Stockholm School of Economics. And uh, I'm going to host uh, this session this morning, this webinar about corporate credit markets. Let's see if I can share my screen. All right. Today we're going to talk about uh, COVID-19 and uh, corporate credit markets together with Peter Ström, who is joining from Swedbank. He is the head of client coverage, large corporates and institutions. Um, and I will uh, start by showing some data on where things are right now, what it looks like uh, to me. And then we have a number of questions um, for Peter. And uh, there will be an opportunity for anyone who's listening live to add questions, uh, to ask for things you want us to talk about or things you um, think I should ask Peter about uh, through the Q&A function. Right. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit about where we are economically and what happens when you shut down the economy. The optimistic scenario, I think, um, you can think of as Christmas or summer vacation. Uh, you have a very quick uh, drop in output. It's mainly due to labor supply. People aren't working. And then you have a very fast recovery as labor supply comes back up. Think Monday morning, think um, end of summer vacations, or think the Christmas shutdown. Um, demand changes may be large in the short run of the current situation, unknown in the long run. Um, so for example, imagine a good that you can hoard. So it's storable prediction, the uh, consumption is predictable, like uh, toilet paper. Um, demand in the long run is not gonna be that different. Demand in the short run could be very high, but it's gonna be offset by you know lower demand over the long run. There might also be some long-term changes um, in this scenario. So although the economy recovers, uh, maybe we'll learn to use fewer personal interactions for some kinds of business. Maybe we travel less, maybe e-commerce gets a kind of permanent boost. Um, these are existing trends that accelerate. Um, in this scenario, public policy can protect a lot of businesses and employment and household consumption in the short run. It may not be perfect, uh, but uh, by using the government balance sheet, basically the economy kind of gets over the hump and then um, quickly the economy rebounds and we're back with high production. Um, and GDP is close to normal. The key caveat here is, of course, that the holiday seasons around Christmas vacations is two weeks long in Sweden. And in the summer, that's a longer period, but the economy doesn't really shut down. It just slows down a little bit. Or think of the weekend, it's just two days. Um, this is an illustration of this. This is industrial production in Sweden. Uh, over the previous preceding five years and you see there's a huge drop in the middle of every year that's july the average drop is 21.6 percent so that's a huge drop obviously and then you see there's a quick recovery you know in, by september we're back up so this is sort of the optimistic scenario now what what's a more pessimistic scenario i guess is that uh the policies that hurt the economy may be long lasting or recurring. Uh, or you can have a short lockdown, but it causes long lasting economic damage because companies go bankrupt and downsize, you have unemployment, or this uh, permanent demand shift, so some Keynesian mechanism. Of course, if we have recurring lockdowns, here's a picture of that this is from some epidemiological study which, uh, which shows the number of intensive care cases in some simulation of the UK and lockdowns are the blue bars uh, when they're high and you see whenever the lockdowns downs disappear 
the case count goes back up and then there's a new lockdown. If we have to do this, then obviously the weekend Christmas vacation metaphor is out the window. So facing this uncertainty, uh, Sweden is in a good spot in terms of low uh, central government debt, same as the Nordic neighbors in Germany. Uh, other countries in Europe and the US are not as well positioned to uh, incur a lot of public spending. Uh, in terms of unemployment, the situation in Sweden is not that great. We don't have great data on what's happened in the last uh, few weeks, but we've heard some really concerning uh, panels from the US. Now, employment protection is different in Sweden, so we don't think the same increase is going to happen. But eventually, if we have a prolonged retraction in the economy, this is going to hurt uh, unemployment too. And this is something I want to talk to Peter about. Unemployment in Sweden coming into this crisis is not great. On the left, on the red uh, numbers are unemployment. And those were 8.2 uh, in February of this year. So pretty high. And have been trending up for a couple of years actually. And in green on the other side is employment as a fraction of the working age population. And this one has been flat. This may be the more important number actually, and it's close to 70, so it's not bad by international standards. Uh, anyway, this is a mixed picture and another 5% of un unemployment would certainly hurt very bad. Okay, what about financial markets? This is a graph showing the US Dow Jones in blue and two Swedish indexes. You don't have to think about which one is which really. Um, all the way back to before the global financial crisis. And at that point, the stock markets lost about half of their value over about a year. This time the drop so far has been about 20%. Very quickly, but still much smaller in percentage terms. Uh, so, so far that, by that metric, the, fin the financial consequences of the lockdown have not been horrible compared to real financial crisis. This is credit spreads. This is, the red line here is high yield. The blue one is investment grade. Um, I picked the particular ratings categories that are closest to the investment grade high yield cutoff. So the blue one is only uh, triple B, so the lowest quality investment grade and the red line is only double B so that's the highest quality high yield uh, and so we compare here the last 20 years of data in the financial crisis in the 2008-9 period which is highlighted in gray um, the increase in spreads was about 500 basis points for triple B bonds corporate bonds and now it's been about 150 so about a third uh, so sort of the same message. This is really bad, but it's not nearly as bad as the financial crisis in terms of financial spreads. But this, you know, we don't have the answer yet. This is only so far. This could get worse, obviously, but that's what it looks like today. <clears throat> One pattern that's been important here is that there's been massive outflows from bond investment vehicles. This is a weekly U.S. mutual fund and ETF uh, flows and they have been massively and historically negative so about a hundred billion over one week uh, this is two weeks ago uh, so that's very uh, disturbing to markets obviously a sell-off like that impacts a market this is not a very liquid market either so it's worse in a way than the stock market so here's a an excerpt from a Swedish news piece about three Swedish uh, fixed income mutual funds uh, closing for redemptions because the managers feel like prices are uh, off balance. These things are likely to stabilize, so maybe this is not a long-term concern. This is more about market liquidity and infrastructure. The other things that are more concerning, however, and here I would like to point to the distribution of credit quality in the corporate sphere. Um, so on the left here, you have the distribution of ratings within investment grade. Blue is AAA that basically doesn't exist in corporates anymore. It used to, but not now. AA is very small. 
single A is large, and the bulk, the biggest part of, of investment grade is triple B. Why is that important? It's important because triple B is just one notch above, uh, one, two, or three notches above high yield. So you're close to being downgraded to high yield. And what happens is when there's a recession or a quick deterioration in the business cycle, the rating agencies are gonna see that some of these firms are not quite as good. Downgrades are gonna push them into high yield territory. And here's a, an article from the Financial Times, I think that was yesterday, uh, which said downgrades flood junk bond market with fallen angels. A fallen angel is someone like Ford, who was investment grade yesterday and is high yield today. So there's more disruption to come, I guess. All right, that's my takeaway from this. Okay, now uh, most corporations don't get credit from the bond market, they get it from the banks. This is the Euro area, um, uh, monthly data on total loans outstanding in billions of euros uh, from banks to non-financial corporations. And that was much higher before the sovereign debt crisis, which is this here this period here and it's recovered slightly. Sweden in a way has been, you know, spared the worst of this. So the numbers are a little stronger. Uh, but as of February, 2020, so this is two months ago, you could not see any Corona, uh, you know, evidence in this data, but I'm sure it's gonna show up next time it gets updated. All right, that's what I wanted to say. Um, so the rest of the day, of the morning, we're going to talk to Peter about uh, credit markets uh, in Sweden and generally, and especially for corporates. Peter has a long career in banking. He's now the head of client coverage, large corporates and institutions. And I wanted to point out that I think it's a quiet period for Swat Bank. So this limits uh, what he can say about the bank itself. Uh, feel free to ask the questions. Peter will be happy to turn us down if we ask something he doesn't want to talk about. Um, okay, so the idea is to talk about three broad areas. We'll go through these one by one. I will monitor the Q&A. So type in your questions as we go along. The first topic is what is the current situation? How can we compare this to earlier crises? Then what happens in corporate credit markets uh, going forward? And third, What's the policy here? What's working? What could be useful? <clears throat> How do we get ourselves out of this economic mess? All right. <laughs> um, welcome, Peter. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. Great. Okay, so let's start off by talking about how bad things are. You've lived through many, uh, in your professional life, you lived through many financial crises. How bad is this and how, how does it differ from what you've seen before? Well, I think uh, everyone who's been uh, involved in, uh, in financing feels that this is a unique, si unique situation. You can always learn from previous uh, crises. Um, but I think uh, you made a, quite a good analogy before when you described the situation that we're in now. Previous crises, has, uh, you know, that there's, a, there's a background uh, to previous crises. Uh, maybe there's a there's an asset bubble, uh, there's been um, debt levels that has been unsustainable, uh, and, and so there's been a, a lack of confidence at one point in time, and then you get a correction, if you will, and a, and a period of uh, lower confidence from consumers. This is different. Um, uh, you know, the world economy, uh, as, as most people know and understand, is driven by consumption. Uh, and in this situation, governments all over the world has uh, all but shut down the possibility to consume. So closing down societies like this um, it really makes an immediate impact and you really can't pour money on it uh, in terms of consumers because uh, again, consumers are uh, barred from going out to consume. In Sweden, as you know, we don't have a total shutdown, but uh, still people are uh, prohibited to move around or, or recommended not to move around freely and not to unnecessarily um, go out and, and uh, go to stores, maybe, uh, basically. So this becomes a, a fantastically big, devastating uh, impact on the economy extremely fast. So in that respect, I think you made a quite interesting uh, 
um, comparison to being off for Christmas or being away from, uh, from for the summer holidays. The question here, what are people coming back to and do they have something to come back to? That's, that I think is the big question right now. Yeah. Is there a, a difference across <clears throat> industries that you can see already that some industries are more affected and some are less? How does that play out? Yeah, obviously, uh, we see that uh, uh, tra the traveling business, the, 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 uh, the leisure business uh, as a whole, uh, hotels, restaurants, uh, uh, they are heavily hit uh, right from the very start. Um, a lot of the retail industry, again, uh, shops and so on, brick and mortar, uh, are also suffering from uh, a shutdown of societies where people can't uh, roam around and, and, uh, and buy, buy things. Mm -hmm. um, there are also winners in, in a way. Uh, there are still uh, parts of the economy that works well. Um, so if you look at uh, food retail, that works fine. Uh, I think we will see e-commerce uh, reaching new highs. Um, Parts of the uh, agricultural business will be uh, will be fine in this situation, um, but I think the biggest problem is that uh, when you keep people from from going to work uh, across the globe, you also disrupt the uh, supply chains. So uh, companies can't produce uh, things, uh, uh, both uh, services and and commodities. And also, um, uh, consumers can't, uh, you know, buy the things. Uh, they are barred from buying it, and of course, confidence levels in uh, consumer right now is also going down rapidly. Mm. Which which industries are you most affected by um, the supply chain disruptions that you mentioned? You you already said both services and manufacturing. It seems like it would be be particularly difficult for manufacturing, but you're saying it affects more widely. Can you develop that? Yeah, in terms of supply chain, um, um, the, the, the big producers, uh, if you look at the industrial companies uh, that we have here in, in Nordic area in Sweden, um, their production facilities are scattered all, all around the globe. Uh, they're in Asia, they're in Europe, in the US, and also here in the Nordics. Uh, so you have a split picture of how these companies can, uh, can get their workers into their factories. And you've seen plenty of uh, uh, companies that has been forced to uh, stop production more or less uh, totally. But you also have a split, split picture. Um, so you have companies uh, with factories in China, for instance, who are now opening up. You've seen that in the, uh, in the uh, car industry. Uh, and uh, you, will, you will see that in more and more industries. I'm sure that slowly but surely uh, companies are being able to start their production again. When it comes to services, um, it's, um, it's more, um, some services companies uh, can still do their business, of course, and they can work remotely from home. Uh, here, it's more um, projects and, and business postponing um, certain um, uh, activities because they don't really know what we will see on the other side of this more acute crisis. The, obviously, that turns postponing and delaying turns into lower economic activity, and then some other firms are going to see lower demand, and then we're in a classic recession scenario. Um, this this has happened faster than other uh, recessions because the lockdown was so quick. Uh, do you have a hope for a quick recovery? What's your what are the macro scenarios going forward? That, that's the million dollar question. And I think that um, most um, uh, economists, uh, same goes for us in, in Swedbank, we do think that uh, um, we will uh, eventually, um, societies just need to open again. The question is just when this will happen. This is the big question. So governments shut down societies, they can open them up again. And, and how will that play out? So what we think is going to happen is that um, there, will, there will be an opening up of societies uh, eventually, of course, uh, hopefully very soon. It just needs to happen soon. Uh, but there are a couple of different scenarios. Um, 
irrespective of when that happens, we will have a large impact on the economy worldwide and, and for sure in Sweden as well for 2020. We'll probably see quite large GDP uh, decrease uh, during this year. Uh, in Swedbank, we have, a, again, a couple of scenarios where we, we see a GDP decrease globally of um, uh, 2% in our base case and 5% in, 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 a more wor in, in, a, in a more dark case. Again, uh, it's extremely difficult to, to see exactly how this will play out. It's going to depend on what do we come out in the other end, uh, what's consumer confidence after that, uh, how, uh, how is bankruptcies developing uh, in Sweden and globally and so on. Basically, how much will unemployment rise? That's going to be the, the trigger for the, the rebound. But we do think that the rebound in 2021 will be should be quite sharp again the uh, situation that we have here is to shut down to contain the contagion which is easy to understand um, so when we open up again uh, the question is do we pick up from where we left off probably not because we will have a lot of bankruptcies we will have unemployment going up rapidly so there will be a period obviously where we need to find a new normal situation for the economy and start building from that. But I do think that we will see a quite uh, rapid uh, increase of economic activity and a, a quite rapid pickup. So 2021, as I see it now, um, should look fairly good. Um, so let's come back to policies later on. Let, let's come uh, narrow things down a little bit to corporate credit markets. Uh, what can you say about how firms, what do firms do in terms of loans? Uh, who can get a loan now? Who wants a loan? How would you describe the picture here? Mm -hmm. Well, for the large corporates uh, in Nordics and certainly for you know, the rest of the world, they have multiple ways of uh, getting the liquidity in. Uh, they went into this situation with strong balance sheets, strong liquidity uh, in general, you could say. What happened was that uh, the capital markets who provided a lot of the Nordic and uh, world economies, uh, sorry, uh, companies <clears throat> with uh, liquidity, meaning the bond market and the corporate paper shorter market, uh, were heavily disrupted you know, when we entered into this phase of closing down societies. Um, that meant that uh, a lot of these companies needed to make sure that they had backup liquidity facilities in another, in another way. And that's where banks come in. So I expect us uh, to see uh, a pickup in um, liquidity financing from banks to large corporations uh, in, in the Nordic area and also around the world, again, to back up and, and make sure that we can bridge a situation where the capital market is not working as it should. And we also, we, we already see, Bo, we already see um, some um, normalization, at least as you described in the, uh, uh, investment grade market. So um, there are uh, buyers in the market. It's possible to emit a bond in, for a uh, uh, investment grade company. Uh, prices are higher than they were before the situation uh, occurred, but it's still possible. Now for high yield companies, that's another picture. I, I feel that that uh, market is still uh, abnormal. Uh, it's, it's extremely difficult, uh, or at least extremely um, uh, pricey for a high yield company to, uh, to uh, emit a bond uh, at this point. So I think that we will see um, uh, a quite large increase of liquidity financing from banks to corporates, again, to bridge the situation. For smaller companies uh, who are not normally in the uh, uh, capital market, they are lending from banks, they also have another, another economic situation. They don't have the massive reserves going into the situation. And many small corporates uh, across the world can't wait for weeks and months to get their business going again. So it, it's, it's really a two-tier situation with large corporates, bridging over the situation, uh, cutting down costs as much as they can. And you've seen a lot of things being done by these companies. 
the big, big challenge will be for the smaller companies that employs a fair amount of people all around the world. How will they cope with a situation when they can't sell? And you, you, you see, you know, 80, 90% falls in, uh, in income. And that's why we just have to come back to a open society very, very quickly, not to have a massive bankruptcy wave uh, ahead of us. Mm. What about, <clears throat> what about real estate? Real estate is, um, call it for many loans. The real estate sector is important. And apparently there's, what I understand is there's um, discussions between, for example, closed down retail businesses and their landlords about postponing, renegotiating rents. Do you know, what can we say at this point about pressures in, in real estate? Uh, again, uh, at least talking about the Nordic real estate market, which I know better. Um, uh, in general, uh, the, the listed the real estate companies that we have here are coming in again in this, uh, coming into this crisis extremely strong. They have very, very strong balance sheets. They have strong um, uh, cash flow and good liquidity reserves. Uh, some of them need to do the same thing as your industrial companies. They need to bridge a situation where the capital market is, if not frozen, it's, it's expensive. I think they will be able to do that. Uh, I also expect them to do uh, have discussions with uh, some of their tenants about uh, uh, helping them, uh, again, bridge the situation. Uh, but I'm not too concerned about the real estate companies in the Nordics. They are uh, very uh, strong economically, financially. So uh, I think they come from a strong position into the situation. But of course, they will be affected. Right. So I... I we have a couple of questions about uh, regret, I guess, is do we regret now that corporate debt was so high two months ago, uh, interest rates have been low, credit spreads have been low, a lot of companies have more debt than they used to, and I show that picture of triple B dominating investment grade. Uh, in hindsight, would we have wished that corporate leverage had been a little bit lower? It's always a question that you can ask it. It's more a philosophical question. What is the right leverage level? I think uh, Nordic companies, again, in general, uh, are well run. Uh, we have a, uh, a good balance between uh, risk capital, uh, uh, external capital, uh, strong uh, cash flows in many respects. Uh, you, you had a graph there on bank lending um, uh, falling uh, since 2012, if I remember correctly. Uh, what we've seen in Sweden, as well, uh, at least, is uh, that um, the, um, uh, the capital market has been an increasingly important source of, of funding where a number of investors have come in, uh, being able to uh, take on risk uh, that has been uh, quite easy to analyze. So. I think that um, what we have here is a situation where the, uh, the capital market has provided uh, long-term financing for companies with, with strong financials. Banks have been there to a lesser degree, perhaps, uh, because the capital market has been so strong. What I th think we see now is uh, the situation is actually working, where, where we have backup facilities for our larger cor corporates that can solve a situation while the capital market is, um, if not unavailable, it's uh, more expensive and finding their new normal. Uh, so uh, no, I, I don't feel that we have uh, regrets in terms of where we are. On the contrary, if I compare with 2008 and that financial crisis, banks are so much stronger, corporates are so much stronger in general than we, we were then. So, uh, um, I think, again, if this abnormal situation with closed communities and closed societies and therefore closed economies open up quite soon, I think it's possible to, to limit the damage. There is devastating damage to certain industries. We will see unemployment go up. It will not be coming back and pick up from where we left off before we stopped. But it's going to be a situation where we can at least uh, continue working with 
um, more or less a strong situation going forward. Right. Um, we had a follow-up question on this, I guess, which is uh, the relationship between different um, sizes of companies. Um, so is there, a, you, you already said there's a divergence. So if you're large, maybe investment grade rating, uh, good solid cash flows, you can access markets and then you can turn, if you think that's too expensive or bad, terms are bad right now, you can go to the bank and get funding too. Uh, whereas smaller, weaker companies maybe cannot get a bank loan right now. Is there also a dynamic where uh, the terms for trade credit are changing, that large solid companies are squeezing suppliers and, and customers? Is this um, I haven't seen that. Um, I have not seen uh, companies, if you're alluding to taking advantage of the situation. Um, right. I think that uh, everyone is trying to cope with a situation which no one has experienced before. I think the trick is to see through the acute crisis that we are in now. Uh, where are we after this acute phase of the situation? And remember that uh, uh, the world's large corporates that may have more financial muscles and ability to access both banks and capital markets they need the, their suppliers and their sub-suppliers to, to be alive and, 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 and be, uh, uh, be there for them to pick up their supply chain when, when this opens up again. So, uh, no, I haven't seen anything of that uh, yet, actually. Okay, that's good news, I guess. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, policies. Right now, uh, across the world, I guess, authorities are trying to support the corporate sector, small businesses, large businesses uh, in various ways. Um, one challenge is that if you want to put public funds in the pockets of uh, businesses, uh, that requires some kind of credit decision, which the public sector, where anyone is pressed, it's hard pressed to do on short notice. And so the banking system is a vehicle in a way for extending support. The Riksbanken has promised to fund corporate credit for Swedish banks. The uptake has not been massive so far. Do you think that's just one of the tools? Do you think these tools are working? Are the, do we have the right tools or are there other policies that would be better? I think talking about Sweden, uh, since you took that example, I think uh, Swedish authorities are, are doing a good job in, in, in uh, scrambling to find ways to uh, alleviate the situation that we're in. Again, with closed societies, you can only do so much because at the end of the day, um, authorities can't sort of replace the uh, income loss that the companies are doing in uh, more than a very, very short period. I think that what the Riksbanken did was, first of all, to, um, to uh, make sure that there was liquidity in the banks and liquidity in the market. Uh, there is extremely strong liquidity, so that is not really the, 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 the issue. Um, uh, authorities like EQN, the uh, Export uh, Gar Credit Guarantee uh, Agency, and SEK have also made, uh, I think, substantial um, uh, things to make sure that uh, uh, banks can lend to companies with uh, more guarantees than, than, than they used to. So I think a lot of those things um, uh, that are happening are, are good things. Uh, for small corporates, uh, there's also initiatives in, in uh, Sweden right now, at Ixielden, for instance, who are making sure that uh, uh, banks can lend to smaller companies with uh, uh, state guarantees as well. These things will will help. It will make sure that there's liquidity out there. Um, the, the tricky question is, uh, banks can only lend money to corporates that uh, can be expected to, to, to shoulder that new debt. 
it, I, I think it's fair to uh, expect that when, when we come out on the other end of this crisis and we will have uh, a worse economy than we had and we need to, to pick up from there, there will be higher leverage in certain companies that they can cope with. Uh, so there will be you know, lower profits for a while and higher leverage. Uh, but if, if income picks up again uh, and business pick up, picks up, uh, many companies will be able to shoulder that. But a small company that um, cannot really uh, shoulder and, and have the cash flow in the long term to take on uh, larger loans, more loans will not be the solution for these companies. Uh, there's something else that, that's needed. So uh, can, can, uh, can the state sort of... Uh, prop up the loss of income uh, for a period of, of time or not? I think that's the, that's the question. And we do see a lot of uh, initiatives taken in that respect as well. But I think that's a difficult thing for, for banks. Banks are expected to lend money to, to companies who are able to shoulder that new debt. And if they can't, it's our, um, uh, we need to advise clients to, to make sure that they take the right decisions. So we shouldn't even uh, extend the loan to someone who we think uh, will not be able to pay back. Yeah, we had a question in the, uh, in the Q&A about the Swiss system of guaranteeing unsecured loans for small corporates. I think Macron, the French president said, no, no French company should be affected. Um, the, the downside to that, obviously, is that there's a very large number of companies. And like you point out, they're not all going to be able to repay. So if you give a lot of credit uh, based on taxpayer money in one way or another, directly or indirectly, uh, a lot of that is going to be credit losses for somebody. And uh, that will be difficult to deal with once we're out of the crisis. So maybe that's why the Swedish uh, set of policies has been a little bit more careful. Um, you cannot take on all the debt and all the bills of all corporations in a country for very long without uh, driving even a sovereign government into distress. No, you're right. It's exactly like that. And, and uh, like I said, Riksjeld and other authorities in Sweden are doing um, uh, a number of things uh, where uh, they extend guarantees to banks who in turn can, can, uh, can lend to companies. We will see that. For sure, we will see that uh, starting up. But again, a bank should not uh, even advise a company to take on more debt if uh, that debt is unsustainable going forward. <laughs> there can be a state, um, uh, what's the word? Uh, uh, a, a, a state giveaway, if you if you want to use that word, to a company, but uh, that's probably quite uh, tricky to 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 uh, to work. There are always uh, also already in Sweden, as you know, uh, initiatives where companies can can uh, postpone their their VAT uh, payments and and tax payments, and also social security payments. Uh, so I think all the things that has been done, I think, in Sweden, in terms of, again, bridging this situation to come out on the other side of this acute crisis, which is the lockdown of societies, uh, are a good thing. The big question mark, again, is when we open up, what economy and what uh, requisites will we have for conducting business in that new economy? And I think that's where no one really knows the answer right now, and it will be a timing issue. The longer we wait with opening up uh, societies, thereby opening up ability com to consume and get the wheels rolling again, the longer we will, uh, the, the more damage we will make uh, to the economy. Is that the difference between your 2%, minus 2% and your minus 5% macro scenarios? The, the difference is how long the people are locked in their homes? More or less, exactly. Um, if you if you if the economy is grinding to a halt and that halt is is you know remaining for a number of time, let's say that lockdowns are being in place uh, up until summer, you can just imagine how many companies that are just being forced to uh, to lay off and even more people to be forced to go bankrupt or go into reconstruction. 
Um, so it, it's not it's not possible to just pick up uh, from where we uh, we started this lockdown. Uh, yes, it's very much a, an equation of time and and how much damage we're doing to the economy. Um, some countries uh, like Germany and the UK uh, have tried to keep companies out of formal bankruptcy proceedings by reducing the obligation of a board of a corporation to, you know, file for bankruptcy or restructuring uh, under the threat of jail or personal or financial liability and so on. Is this something that you think might be useful in Sweden too? Um, uh, honestly, I don't know. Um, again, I, uh, I, I know um, plenty of entrepreneurs. Uh, they, they, they take a lot of risks in, in peacetime, uh, in driving their business and creating, creating jobs, uh, which I think is fantastic. Um, if if uh, in this situation, which is more a, you know, a, a crisis and warlike situation to, to take on even more risk and trying to see through um, what comes out on the other end, even if there are um, changes to the, to the regulation in terms of what your own liability is, um, uh, these entrepreneurs are still taking quite huge uh, personal risks for their economy and so on. So again, uh, it, it boils down to what business do I have when I come out of this crisis? What's my income? What's my cost level? And what's my ca what's my cash flow? Uh, and what's the what's a reasonable leverage of uh, running this business um, after this crisis? So again, the, the the damaging thing is since no one knows how long this will last, uh, no one is able to say what we will what we will have on the other end. On macro level, it's somewhat easier because at one point this just have to end obviously uh, will there be um, um, uh, a demand for consumption of many things around the world both uh, private and corporate consumption obviously but in on the micro level what type of companies will be needed uh, what changed behaviors have we, will we see after this crisis and so on? Will there be a lingering sort of a uh, confidence, uh, lower confidence uh, because of this contagion and so on? Um, I, I don't know, but I think uh, again, talking to a lot of entrepreneurs, uh, this gets real, very real, very fast in just making a uh, ca calculation, uh, what do I need when I come out of this? So uh, I'm sorry for the long answer, but I think it's a, it's a, difficult, it's a difficult question. Yeah. Um, so I guess in, <clears throat> in capital structure theory, uh, the cost of distress and the cost of bankruptcy are one reason you don't want to have too much debt. And those costs are that are related to things like um, closing down businesses that are worth more as a going concern or selling assets at a very bad time and you have to sell to people who don't really value the assets very highly. And a big lesson or a big takeaway from this line of research is that these costs are higher when everybody else is in trouble too. Um, so I guess that's a reason to, to be worried about this. Uh, and like you say, the big problem is if the recession is d deep and long, lending more money to farms is not really going to help it. It's just going to postpone it, and then it might be worse. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, another question here. We have a lot of questions. Uh, we're not going to be able to deal with all of them. I'm selecting a few. Uh, I think we have one or two questions about the rest of Europe. Now, your business is mostly Northern Europe. I think Swedbank has very little activity in Southern Europe. Those countries are, some of the countries in Southern Europe, Italy notably, are more affected by the disease right now and are coming into it with very high public debt burdens and a weaker banking system. How do you think that impacts their ability to deal with the crisis? Well, uh, as you say, we're, we're mostly in North, Northern Europe, so this is going to be just my, my personal um, um, 
uh, thoughts. Um, but, but again, it, it's just common uh, economic theory with, with going into a crisis like this with weaker financials, both in the, in the banking system and, and in, in the economy as a whole, obviously that will hit these economies uh, much more. And just to uh, put even more burden on these, the, the, the economies that you mentioned, um, they are heavily uh, reliant on tourism and, and travel. Um, so when you shut down that, um, it, it hits these economies even more and, and again, that's uh, the question of when we come out of this, when the lockdowns are taken out, will there be a lingering um, uneasiness of traveling? Will we see, uh, will we see domestic uh, vacations being the thing of 2020 uh, around the world and in Europe? Uh, countries like Italy and Spain and, and Greece and so on, they, they, they are dependent on people coming in to, to consume from other countries. So that remains to be seen, um, but uh, uh, it's never an advantage, of course, to, to uh, come into a crisis uh, from a weak situation. Yeah, we're, we're planning to go to Italy this summer. I don't understand if we're supposed to cancel that or not. I guess I will find out. Um, so um, this is the quiet period, and I don't wanna uh, try to prod too much about your own bank, uh, but you had a press release this morning about um, including information about uh, accounting uh, uh, reserving uh, for future credit losses according to accounting rules. Is this something you can talk a little bit about? Is this uh, corporate borrowers who have defaulted on their payments or is this a more forward looking situation? Yeah, as we say in our press release, um, we do have um, uh, regulations that, uh, that uh, forces all banks to, uh, at every moment in time, make assessments of their lending portfolio and evaluation of it. And when, uh, when any event happens in the market, we just need to reassess whether the risk in the portfolio is uh, unchanged or not. Uh, that's an obligation that we have. Now, this huge event, which is the corona crisis, if you want to call it that, with um, uh, lockdown societies and, and, and companies that are losing income and employment increasing, um, what we do there is uh, a, a reassessment of how this will impact us. Now, again, uh, we need to be very humble in this because it is a, an early assessment of this, how this event uh, is impacting us. We will see... Uh, uh, we will see all banks going into this uh, uh, now day by day you know, during Q2 and, and, and forward to see how are uh, specific companies impacted by this. As we talked about before, on micro level, we probably will see uh, quite different uh, uh, aspects of how this hits companies and some will even be winners. But this is very much as uh, a portfolio view of uh, that there's a negative event in the market and that we need to uh, take into account. That's more or less what we're saying in the uh, press release. Okay. Um, staying with Swedbank a little bit, you see the bank sees a lot of payments flows. Um, you have relationships with many households and many corporations. So in a way you have your, your finger on the pulse of the economy uh, more than almost anybody, uh, is this, what is the implication of this? Do you share this kind of information with authorities? Uh, does it help, can it help guide medical or at least economic policy making, or is this all impossible because of GDPR and so on? Um, we, we do uh, get a lot of, uh, if you want to call it big data, about how payments uh, are developing uh, every day uh, in terms of uh, retail and, and, and all the types of payments that we are part of as the, in the financial system. And um, uh, there's been also information out in the market of how you can actually track the uh, lowering um, intensity uh, of, of payments. It's nothing that, uh, that I can uh, um, uh, talk about specifically and, and name numbers, but uh, we for, for sure see 
uh, what you and I and everyone on this call see uh, in the city or where we live every day, that there is a uh, lowered uh, uh, economic activity from, people con uh, from people's consumption, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, here's a question that I think uh, connects to what we talked about before about how you open up, which I think is, is something you've thought a little bit about. So you're saying it's urgent to try to open up the economy. And what that means, I guess, is that we try to ease off on some of the lockdown, maybe open more um, schools, restaurants, offices, allow more travel, maybe subject to some kind of testing uh, regime. Um, now, even if policies were all revoked in Sweden today, all the uh, epidemiological, you know, concerns are, are gone, or at least the policies are gone, uh, there will still be low demand for maybe traveling internationally and so on. So how do you see, do you have a view on the long term um, kind of implications for the economy? Will we live differently after, after this? A great question. Um... And these are also only my, my personal uh, views. Uh, being through, um, I, I'm, I lost count on how many crises, but you know, um, every 10 years or so there's a crisis. And, uh, and uh, the thing here is that it, it's quite unique, uh, like I talked about, uh, uh, considering the lockdowns. But I think there is one thing that you can learn. Uh, the, the, this again is my personal view is that um, at one point in time, uh, we need to open up. Uh, yes, I think there may be a lingering um, um, low confidence in, in, in uh, sort of traveling maybe. Uh, there may be um, lower confidence in terms of more people have lost their jobs, so they want to uh, hold on to their money more than they did before. Um, but again, um, I think that we will reach a point when the uh, contagion is diminishing, uh, we see a number of deaths go coming down, societies are opening up. At one point, I guess there will be a vaccine and so on. So looking back a number of months from now, or let's say a year from now, I think personally that uh, we will have probably the situation that we had in previous um, crises. Looking back at it with the uh, uh, rear view mirror, saying that, okay, um, shouldn't we've been able to uh, understand that this situation couldn't uh, continue forever? This was how it played out. Was that so difficult to understand? And why was it uh, unreasonable that uh, once the economy came out of this shutdown, things were going to pick up again and so on, and 2021 should be a, quite a good year? I'm not saying that will happen, but I'm saying that it's quite reasonable to expect such a uh, development. So I'm quite, um, personally, I'm quite optimistic that as, as um, ugly the situation we have now with a lot of heartache in terms of people dying and so on, the uniqueness again is that once we uh, open up societies again, I think we will see a quite rapid uh, pickup. And coming into 2021, I think we will see a quite rapid uh, increase of business and, and, and economies. Uh, I don't have no, I have no protection, predictions about the, the, the stock market. Uh, I, I, I have no way of knowing how that's gonna develop. And in a way, um, I wouldn't be surprised if the stock market um, development and the real economy development will be quite different. Uh, the stock market, normally are ahead of the real economy with quite a large margin. Right. So you want to be an optimist. I want to be an optimist too. I'm surprised actually that there haven't been more comparisons to 9-11 and the economic implications of that. That was also even more a surprise maybe than this. <clears throat> and uh, very brief, obviously, the impact. So the recovery was easier in some ways. Uh, but that that was an economic blip, and things went back to <clears throat> normal very quickly. However, <clears throat> they didn't go exactly back to what they were before. I don't know <clears throat> how many people remember this, but before 9-11, 
You could walk into an airport. You just walked all the way to the gate. Nothing stopped you. Very convenient, fast. You didn't have to get to the airport <clears throat> early. Uh, you didn't have to uh, <clears throat> finish your water bottle before you went to security, all of that. And so it didn't quite go back to normal. So I imagine that this time it might be a little bit like that. We have to change some habits. We have to keep washing our hands every day. I think that's a good uh, comparison, actually, but about 9-11, because if, if you remember, the, the, there was a fear factor after the event um, that uh, more terrorist attacks would occur around the world. And there was a real sense of dread for, for uh, a few months. And then uh, slowly but surely, confidence came back because actions were taken and there was a, at least a sense that um, uh, the world was doing something, something about this terrorist threat. Uh, there was at least a sense of that. And then norm normality came back in a way. And in that way, I think you are very correct to, to do the comparison because in this situation where when confidence come back that uh, the contagious, contagious is under control, um, uh, the, 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 the leaf, the, what do you call it? The, the, um, how deadly it is will, I guess, will be more and more um, uh, transparent. And most importantly, when there's a vaccine, uh, the confidence level hopefully can come, come back uh, like they were. But as you say, I think we will have some changed behaviors that not necessarily go away afterwards. And that will uh, absolutely um, create opportunities for entrepreneurs and for companies uh, to uh, explore new ways to, uh, to increase their business. So there will be winners and there will be losers uh, after each crisis. A crisis is a good way to, re to harvest opportunities, that's for sure. But there's, there's gonna be a lot of uh, problems as well, obviously. Yeah, we certainly hope that we're gonna go back to seeing our students face to face at some point. Um, we're running out of time. There's a lot of interesting questions. Uh, I would say there's two main themes uh, or two big themes among the questions that I see from the participants. One is uh, small firms and what can be done to help them. And I think we've talked about it then that there's no easy answer in that lending more money to companies that can't support the debt, in your view, is not necessarily uh, a good idea, speaking like a true banker. Another question, which maybe we have not spoken so much about, and which might be our ending note, is do you think that we're learning something here about the balance between corporate credit markets and institutions, or bank loans versus bonds? Have the markets expanded too much? Um, do you have any kind of lessons uh, in that regard? I think the lesson is, um, is um, one that uh, most entrepreneurs and companies uh, actually know from the start. Um, when you um, finance your company, you do that from multiple sources. You have an item of risk capital from your investors. And you do also make sure that you have external capital from both banks and from the capital market. If you do that, you make sure that you don't, uh, as, as it's called, uh, place all your eggs in one basket. That, that is how you make sure that you have a balance in whatever you do. And balance is always, always a good thing. And, and just to end on your note about the small companies. I mean, um, uh, many of these companies have sound business ideas uh, and they will be sound after this crisis as well. So we will see a lot of companies surviving this situation, absolutely. We will see banks like uh, my own bank and other banks making sure that there are uh, moratoriums of amortizations and so on. So it's not only about increasing debt levels. Some companies can, can, uh, can, can take that on, but uh, uh, first, of, first of all, just to remain on the, um, uh, level that they have today, making sure that their dwindling cash flow uh, can can um, survive this extreme period. I think here we can we can help our small corporates as well. Uh, yeah, yeah, great. That's a an excellent point to end. An optimistic note. Thank you so much, 
Peter Ström of Swedbank for joining us today uh, at the Swedish House of Finance. Thank you very much. My pleasure.